You can listen to The Professional Left on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for January 11th, 2019. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the Cornfield Resistance, where time is a flat circle. It's the professional left with Drip Glass and Blue Gal. Which, a flat circle, you know. Which, which we we uh, enjoyed very much during its first season. We do not speak of the second season, <laughs> uh, and the third season, I believe, starts this Sunday. We look forward to that and seeing how, checking it so, out. Uh, yeah, hopefully mm-hmm. they learned their lesson. I, I believe they. Well, they must have. Really, I mean, <laughs> how could they not? Honestly, when you've had a hot iron pressed to your face that yeah. long, yeah, um, you you maybe just go back and. Do it the way you should right. do it. Right. And, and we want to wish ourselves a happy ninth anniversary. This is not a self-aggrandizement show, uh, but we have no. been podcasting for nine years this yes. week. And yes. uh, you wanted to bring back some original fake sponsors this week. I did. I I, I made the mistake. Uh, there's a scene from uh, um, Wonder Boys <laughs> towards the end <laughs> where, okay. where Michael Douglas has written a novel that is 3,000 pages long or something like that. He's carrying around in cardboard boxes. Did. And so You made me laugh he's, about he's, this now, you son of a bitch. I got to tell I, you. No, I'm sorry. Um, and he's finally asked by the people he's driving around with who are integral to, this, to the story, what was it about? You know, what? And, and uh, uh, Robert Downey Jr. plays his agents, keeps trying to explain it in very agent writerly terms. And uh, finally, it's, you know, why did you keep writing it? And the answer was, because I couldn't stop. Yeah. Um, so I thought it would be a clever idea to go through nine years worth of show notes and do a retrospective. And when I hit the 55th page of our show notes, I yeah, thought, Yeah, he had hey, 54 pages of show notes for me to look at. Yeah. yeah. So I, I thought, was not a happy camper. I, I, I might have gone you. too far. So I dialed it back um, by giving it to my wife, who cut it down to a sensible length. 27 but, pages. 27 pages. <laughs> But the point was, the point really is that, um, and, and when going through our show notes, I discovered our first, uh, our very first fake sponsor, which is McGovern's Muffins, and our second one, which was Dukakis Khakis. That was Michael Dukakis's line of sensible men's pants. Um, they've returned for a victory lap. McGovern's Muffins, building strong plots 12 ways. And Dukakis Khakis, they're not so good for running in. Um, so and that brought that back, you back. Those it of does. Those who have been with us for a long time. It really does. Like up and muffins, building strong plot points, 12 ways. Yeah. We, we, uh, remember them and, uh, continue on. Yes, indeed. And, uh, we'll bring those guys back again, I'm sure. Uh, and you also wanted to mention red, the hunt for red October while yes. we're messing around with cultural references. <laughs> because all great ideas come from the Godfather or the hunt for red October. Oh, so, okay. Um, but there's a specific scene and because news has been happening really fast. I mm-hmm. mean, I, I feel like we've been like sprinting down a hill going faster and faster, just trying to keep our balance to keep up with the daily um, authoritarian lunacy of Donald Trump and the Republican Party. And it's it's really easy to lose your perspective when you're just living day to day. And there's just what crazy shit came down the pipe today. And so there's this scene in The Hunt for Red October where Courtney B. Vance, who plays Jonesy, um, picks up a sound that the computer keeps identifying as magma displacement because the computer doesn't know any better. And and Jonesy cleans it up and he tapes it and cleans it up and replays it at 10 times normal speed. And at that speed, you can hear a very distinctive mechanical man-made pattern. Mm -hmm. And you can also track it. You can see that this machine is going someplace it's going someplace very specific and just as an exercise i cracked open our show notes for all 460 74 episodes and went through most of them to looking for patterns looking for things that happened over the course of time that repeat in a way that tells me there's something else going on here besides just the daily news and there are a lot there are a lot that really do emerge and it's also interesting to see what we were talking about 
when we were doing our first podcast, which took place before Barack Obama's second election. Mm -hmm. Right. We were recording before Citizens United. Right. Um, Yeah. And so we do have a little bit of history to bring to the table. So when you specifically, when you hear Republicans, especially our new very good friends, the Never Trumpers, saying, you know, this is this all just happened yesterday. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the Republican Party was doing fine right up until just two minutes ago. Then Donald Trump came down an escalator and it all went wrong. That's a lie. And we know it's a lie because we were recording podcasts and we were blogging well before Donald Trump ever showed up. And all the characteristics the Republican Party have on display every day were there the whole fucking time. All you had to do was pay attention. So. The magma displacement, the mainstream media would try to tell you that this is just uh, the flow of history. And it's not. It's boom, boom, boom. Bill Crystal, David Brooks, both siderism, and some very, very, very bad economic and international policies that come from Republicanism, not Trumpism. Mm-hmm. So uh, with that, uh, and no further ado, <laughs> we're going to read... Yeah. 27 pages of show notes, which I hope you will find entertaining. (laughs) So, for example, in October of 2010, the professional left was broadcasting live from inside the vortex of Juan Williams' shame spiral, which doesn't mean anything in 2019. This was a reference to Juan Williams getting canned by NPR for things he said on Fox News. And what he was saying on Fox News was to Bill O'Reilly, who also doesn't mean anything in 2019, talking about how he feared Muslims when he was flying on aircraft. And this started a whole controversy about how, where do you draw the line? Not in what people say, but it, that the social media and the networks had broken up into sort of safe spaces. You were never to be held accountable for what you said in one place in your other place of business. And this started cross crossing things over into, well, what about what this asshole said across the street? Doesn't, don't we have to hold them to our standards over here? Uh, We also talked about how we, as a country, never grieved properly or took honest stock of what happened during the Bush administration, that the House was on fire and it was all hands on deck, and Obama went into reassure mode, and by the time we looked up, the teabaggers were busy blaming the firemen and celebrating the arsonists. And then in June of 2011, we were at Netroots Nation, and they were uh, holding their conference right next to the Right Online conference. There was a distinct feeling that uh, the party had moved on, uh, a noticeable lack of A-listers, virtually zero media. Of course, it was a, a non-election year uh, up in Minneapolis. The only TV camera we saw was for Fox 9, a local <laughs> Fox affiliate. Uh-huh. Uh, in 2012, the Internet kiddies were pissed because they almost had Herman Cain as the Republican nominee, and actually he dropped out in 2011. Mm-hmm. Uh, he would have gotten away with it, too, if it weren't for those meddling kids. Um, in January of 2012, on, in episode 109, if you want to look it up, uh, Willard Mitt Romney taught us a valuable lesson that even the most diehard members of the Republican base are afflicted with what we came to call strategic forgettery. And that if you have enough money, you can just lay siege to their denial until it collapses. Romney, in 2012, was the triumph of money over democracy. Hard to believe that in 2012 we had Mitt Romney as the Republican nominee. But we did. Yeah. And we were there. We We were covering it. Yes, we were. In August of 2012, Drift Glass quoted Friedrich Nietzsche. I'm not upset that you lied to me. I'm upset that from now on I can't believe you. And boy, howdy, does that apply today, especially to the never Trumpers, frankly. Uh, From September 14th of 2012, episode 146, we entitled that 47% and Mitt Romney's political sister wives. And that's because Mitt had two political wives who hate each other and who each hate him every time he appears to be siding with one or the other of them. There's the main line versus the base conservatives. Who will win his heart? Trick question. Neither of them want his heart. (laughs) What heart? (laughs) (laughs) The week of September 28th, 2012, uh, Drift Glass finally closed on his condo and departed Chicago permanently for the cornfield. Mm-hmm. Now, we didn't even mention that in August of 2011, we got married. No, we did. Well, yeah. We have an anniversary coming up, so I, I, I didn't want to spoil it for, for everyone. <laughs> August, yeah, we do. We'll be married, uh-huh. uh, what is it, eight years this mm-hmm. August. Yeah. 
But he finally closed on his condo, and after fees and taxes and paying off the bank, he netted five dollars. <laughs> I did. <laughs> Which put you ahead of millions of your fellow citizens. That is true. You didn't foreclose. Mm -hmm. um, no. Nope. Kept your credit didn't rating. Didn't short sell it. Yep. It yep. was. Uh, uh, and it was sold to a verified buyer who was going to live there. So that all of that is for the good. In October of 2012, October 12th, actually, um, we get letters from you all all the time. And we do say, uh, unless you tell us otherwise, we're going to we might read this on the air. And so we started doing that. And we got a letter that read in part, quote, I guess I'm writing this email because you often call out people who say yes, but the Democrats are just as bad. I feel that this is an accurate statement. It's hard for me to do. I feel that this is an accurate statement. It's hard for me to differentiate between the two parties. Back in 2012, my reply was, as to both sides, my point has never been that Democrats are pure. It is that regardless of the issue, when GOP malfeasance or fraud is exposed, which happens every day, our media instantly rushes in to reflexively assert that Democrats or liberals are just as bad, virtually always with no supporting evidence and no one challenging it. It's actually creepy how pervasive it is, like, say, Tom Brokaw. Uh, that was in 2012. In 2019, I would ask, are you still having this problem? Is it still really hard to Is distinguish hard between to the two parties? Between the two parties, hmm. yeah. Hmm. Tricky. Hmm. Hmm. Tricky business. Anyway. From December 14th of 2012, a month after Romney got trounced, David Brooks predicted a Republican glassnost. <laughs> he does this all the time. And he and does he it every really months. noticed it. Uh, yeah. He had done a reasonable Republican renaissance scam from the 90s, which was going to be Marco Rubio and Paul Ryan. Uh, in 2010, it was going to be led by Rick Perry. And before that, it was Meg Whitman. In 2009, it was John Thune. Whatever happened to John Thune? He was standing behind Mitch McConnell a couple of weeks ago. Yes, he was. He's still there. Uh, in 1999, George Bush and John McCain were on the verge of creating a one nation conservatism. In 2001, we were entering a period of competent conservatism and reactionary liberalism. In 2002, he predicted the re-emergent Republican majority. He has, this is his thing, is yeah. to patch together and spackle, spackle, spackle and spray on a lot of gold paint and say, the new Republican Party is better than ever. That is uh, his shtick, yeah. This is why Blue Gal coined the Beltway Iron Rule of David Brooks. I did. I did. That was my, that was the one David Brooks thing that I contributed, which is yes to, to the is, culture. It is required to quote what David Brooks said last week. It is forbidden to quote what David Brooks said any time before that. Yeah, yeah you just it's basically. and and we we break that rule all the time, which is what makes us pariahs in the media. There you go. Um, in January of 2013, January 4th show, 2013, we noted that many crazy wild votes were coming down the pike all in a row. See if these sound familiar. The fiscal cliff. Does anyone remember the fiscal cliff? Sequestration was coming down the road. Violence against women. Hurricane Sandy was being, uh, relief was being filibustered. Coming up next would be sequester two. Sequester even harder. And of course, the, drum more please, the debt ceiling, which is that big, pointless red self-destruct button that you must never push that we've wired into our economy for no earthly reason. And at the time, the internet kiddies were selling slightly used fiscal cliff sham wows in the gift shop of the professional left. That's right. And Eric Cantor was looking for budget cuts to pay for Hurricane Sandy relief. Uh -huh. Think about that. <laughs> Jesus Christ. January 10th, 2013, that was the week we took up Go Postal Unions as the unofficial motto of the professional left with prompting from Jeffrey, a proud U.S. Postal Service employee. January 25th, we took note of the fact that Bar uh, Barack Obama's second inaugural address was a lovely and hopeful speech. Four years later, Donald Trump would be snarling about American carnage from the same podium. April 2013 was the first Bible bitch. Yeah. That's not scriptural. June, no. And, and and see, you you put that into the lexicon, too. I did. That's not scriptural. Uh, June 28th, 2013, CNN announced plans to revive Crossfire with, wait for it, Newt Gingrich and S.E. Cup. Oh, Lord. I didn't, we didn't balance this out to say who was going to read what. I'm going to no. have you read the next one because I just, I you don't, can't. yeah, I just don't want to. <laughs> Uh, Ju July 26, 2013 was the week of Carlos Danger. Oh, Carlos Danger, unlike Bill Clinton, 
There is no vast conservative conspiracy to take Wiener down. He generates no sympathy because he's such a pure asshole. Also, the Internet kiddies couldn't figure out why Anthony Wiener's owners didn't just have him fixed. Uh, another listener letter came through that week. Um, I take I have to take a break from your podcast. I am heartily weary of you telling me I should like the current shit sandwich because it's tastier than the other shit sandwich. I was just note again six years later. How's that sandwich tasting now? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think that person's listening to us anymore. No, That's all no. Right. Well, I, I bet I bet Glenn Greenwald's fans are listening to us either. Yeah. Um, and I yeah. and I know why. Yeah. Anyway, August twenty third, twenty thirteen, Clint Murphy, a longtime Republican campaign staffer who supports the Affordable Care Act for a pretty simple reason: he wants health insurance, but as a cancer survivor, his pre existing condition makes that impossible. In spite of the fact that the only way he was going to get health insurance coverage was through the Affordable Care Act, Murphy was supporting right-wing U.S. Senate candidate Karen Handel in Georgia. Uh, in spite of her verbalized intention to destroy the federal health care law and take away his health insurance opportunities. Mm -hmm. just That's just the disconnect. He'll die on that uh, hill, literally. He yep. was willing to die really, on that hill really and take and take millions of people with him. Mm -hmm. And remember the 2013 Republican debt ceiling threats? <laughs> In private discussions, GOP leadership aides acknowledge they have absolutely no idea how they'll lift the $16.7 trillion debt ceiling. Oh, that seems mm -hmm. so small by comparison. Isn't that tiny? Uh, In case you were wondering how we got Trump, September 20th, 2013, that was the week that Chuck Todd stated categorically that it was not the media's job to call out the GOP when they lie, period, full stop. There was a betting pool is now open as to which fake conservative crisis will be trotted out to distract the media this time. Is it going to be flag burning, English only, contraception? The field is wide open until the field closed and it became Benghazi, Benghazi all the time. It absolutely did. Mm-hmm. November 1st, 2013, the government shut back, excuse me, the government shutdown is now behind and ahead of us. The idiots who rule us are racing to get back to their both sides happy place because the shutdown's over. Once again, the real enemy is both siderism and they're still talking about the debt ceiling. Obamacare is finally open for business, but we are paying for the price for letting the right off the hook before and before and before. And in December of 2013, everyone who's listened to that our podcast back then knows Minecraft was a big deal. It took over our house. It literally <laughs> took over our house. Uh, January 10th, 2014, the week of, that was the week that David Brooks talked to America's youth about pot. So that was exciting. Um, Chuck Todd proposed that both Mitch McConnell and Harry Reid step aside because their relationship is, quote, in the toilet and at this point, getting the relationship between party leaders is more important than, quote, figuring out who's to blame. Does this sound familiar? Yep. February 7th, 2014, disgraced monster Bill Crystal joined ABC News. Dana Lash subbed on The View. And James Carville was hired by Fox News. Drift Glass told our listeners, look, if Green Glenn Greenwald is not the story, stop making Glenn Greenwald the story. And Andrew Sullivan shifted to a subscription model. And he appeared to be morphing into Andy Rooney and Charles Kroll hybrid, uh, who never actually travels anywhere. Yep. <laughs> During the week of March 7th, 2014, our old, our very own Affordable Care Act nightmares were being, uh, were upon us, were whiplashing us. Uh, we checked in on the CPAC 2014 convention. And it was every bit the freak show you might imagine it to be. There were two separate tributes to Andrew Breitbart. There was a John Bolton book signing and a climate change panel featuring the Heartland Institute and Murray Energy. Guess what they concluded? Yeah. Climate change sucks <laughs> and only is a big liberal plot and is not really real. This was in 2014. March 28th, 2014, Donald Rumsfeld on Fox News whined about the Obama administration's handling of Afghanistan saying, quote, a trained ape, unquote, could have done a better job in diplomatic relations. Yeah. By the week of, by the week of May 16, 2014, 
it was all Benghazi all the time. Uh, ben, the reasonable one, Sass, you might remember, won the GOP Senate primary, primary in Nebraska, which is my dad's home state. In addition to wanting to get rid of health care for millions of Americans, Ben Sass said the following. This election must be about saving our country from the establishment, dismantling Obama's failed socialist policies, and disrupting the current system. Remember when disruption was cool? Then we can fight the real conservative battle, protecting our values, traditional marriage, the right to life, the Second Amendment, stopping the rampant borrowing and spending, even taking on the Supreme Court if that's what it takes. Remember, Ben Sass is the reasonable one. May 23rd, 2014, we note that the Republican Civil War is over and the South won. Mm -hmm. This is a year before Donald Trump showed up. Yep. On June 6th, we just want to mention, we, we do a little housekeeping here every now and then. This is sort of a little behind-the-scenes action I pulled out of our notes. Uh, on our show of June 6th, 2014, Junior Dude's friends arrived, interrupting our show at the 15-minute mark. After 27 minutes, the sound cut out. And after 53 minutes, the youngest child burst in needing immediate attention. This is all really very typical. Yeah, and this is stuff uh, you never hear because I cut it all out. Because yep. my because my beautiful wife cuts it all out and makes uh, me less of a rambling lunatic who does nothing but talk about David Brooks. Uh, Liz Cheney, who's a mother and a patriot, whose all-important defense of the American think tank Keep America Safe, which has not only dis been disbanded, but has been scrubbed from the Internet. This was co-founded for, wait for it, Bill Crystal. Co-founded by Bill Crystal, Keep America Safe. You can't find that anywhere on the Internet. Yep. No. Keep America safe. Won't see them no more. July 11th, 2014, Dinesh D'Souza was busy blaming Google because Googling America doesn't take the Internet straight to his movie. Also, David Brooks dreamed up a new species of conservative called the Reformicons, and they're going to fix everything. So settle down, people. Everything's going to be fine. September 5th, 2014, get ready for two years and nothing. Best case scenario, two more years of the House killing everything in its tracks. Worst case scenario, a GOP Senate gives Obama nothing to sign but XL pipeline and ACA defunding bills and shuts the government down every time Obama vetoes anything or he sneezes. Also impeachment. This is a terrible way to govern, but a terrific civic lesson for future generations. Yeah, and we're having lots of civics lessons every day now, aren't we? Aren't we? Th aren't we just? This is, again, everything you're seeing in the news today is simply an echo of how the Republican Party has always behaved. September 12th, 2014, David Brooks blames ISIS on Woodstock. No, really. Even David Letterman noticed that Chuck Todd is kind of terrible. Week of September 19th, 2014. See if this sounds at all familiar. Republicans block Elizabeth Warren's bill to help save college students from crippling debt. That was the week the, the Congress began a seven-week vacation after coming back from a two-month vacation. Recently unemployed David Gregory headlined a No Labels event at which he bitched about how lazy the media had become and what a shame it was that it just passively promoted the conventional wisdom narrative. Yeah, said without irony. September 28th, 2014, Andrew Sullivan began to suspect that quite possibly Republicans aren't 100% serious about the deficit. October 10th, my brother's birthday, 2014, the number of patriot groups, including armed militia, skyrocketed during the election of President Barack Obama in 2008, rising 813 percent from 149 groups in 2008 to an all-time high of 1,360 in 2012. And let's not forget that in 2010, no, excuse me, 2009, the uh, Department of Homeland Security issued a report about right-wing groups, gun groups, and militia groups Mm -hmm. and that they might be a danger to Homeland Security. Yep. And Michelle Malkin lost her shit mm -hmm. and, and said that they were silencing conservative voices and pretending they were terrorists. And uh, there, there were terrorists, and they are terrorists. There yes. are militia groups that are terrorists against black people, and it rose to 1,360 in 2012. Absolutely. On January 2nd, 2015, just one day into the new year, Chuck Todd accidentally told the truth on his TV show. Quote, we all sit there because we all know the first time we bark is the last time that they do the show. You say something and something is the, it is, and sometimes it is the last time they will ever come on the show. That, there is that balance. Sorry, my, my screensaver cut in in the middle of that. 
Um, Chuck Todd just told a bunch of comedians, actually, that he doesn't challenge people on his show because then they won't come back. They won't come back on. And, yep. no, and we knew this. We and, and every liberal knew this. Anyone who watches the show knows that's the, that's the scam. It's a puppet show, and it always has been. And sadly, it looks like it always will be. By March 20th of 2015, we were already discussing how to give Science Fiction University a bigger role. Little did we realize. <laughs> yeah, we weren't planning on this. Also, March 20th, 2015, both Glenn Beck and Eric Erickson decided to leave the GOP because the GOP wasn't crazy enough yet. Spoiler, they both came back. Oh, uh, and this is also the week two of America Held Hostage. Have you noticed that no one is talking about Bill O'Reilly anymore? O'Reilly had been caught flat out lying on television. Worse lies than the ones that had gotten Brian Williams sacked. Roger Ailes fired back that O'Reilly's ratings were awesome, so fuck you. Which is exactly the same line Donald Trump would take two years later. Facts are irrelevant because my poll numbers are amazing. And for a very short period of time, uh, Rachel Maddow talked about this. Yeah. And nobody cared. Yeah. And then... It, they stopped, and the only people who talked about it after three weeks or four weeks or five weeks, notorious liar Bill O'Reilly still has his job, was the Professional Left Podcast. On April 10th, 2014, our show was recorded live just outside the Appomattox Courthouse because we are always just outside the Appomattox Courthouse. Uh, April 17th, 2014, a little hometown news. Governor Hedge Fund broke the autism network here in Illinois on World Autism Day. Very exciting political move there, Gov. He funded it, yes. Uh-huh. Uh, a commentator at my blog, at, at the Drift Class blog, said that there were plenty of people in the autism parenting community who voted for Rauner because he was going to go after those bad people in Chicago and leave us alone. Oopsie. Yeah, that sounds familiar. <laughs> May 15th, 2015, we're jumping ahead a year. Uh, mm -hmm. We recorded live from the Sterling Cooper and Draper LLC's going out of business sale because we were going to miss Mad Men. Jeb Bush was busy being stupid and saying, please clap. Joe Scarborough was lying out of both sides of his mouth. Stephanie Miller said this week, on May 15, 2015, that she would no longer do their right-wing watch feature because it was getting so repetitive. And this is kind of why you uh, occasionally take a pause on the Sunday shows. It's just too repetitive. Yeah. It's a machine operated by people who never feel the need to answer to people like us. Yep. It's the same it's shame shit every week. On March 29th, 2015, the New Yorker review of David Brooks's book boldly ignores every single thing he has ever written about politics. The New York Times announced that the Democratic Party was becoming too liberal at their peril. Uh, Bruce Bartlett announced that Fox News makes Republicans stupid, which I couldn't agree with more. Joe Scarborough insisted that Elizabeth Warren must attack Amtrak unions if she wants to be taken seriously. And Ann Coulter just gave up and went full-on racist. Again. Mm -hmm. June 5th, 2015, Rick Santorum said the Pope, who, by the way, has a master's degree in chemistry, should leave climate change to the scientists. June 26th, 2015, Bill O'Reilly was such a dick this week that we are once again forced to remember that he has not been fired for lying on the air. Ann Coulter is now a full-on Klansman. And notorious birther Donald Trump loses the Miss Universe contract from Univision because racism apparently still has consequences. That was the month that that happened, June of 2015. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was. July 3rd, 2015, Bree Newsom snatches down the Confederate flag from the South Carolina State House. Hell yeah. July 10th, 2015, Donald Trump takes over the Republican Party and gets a call from Reince Priebus. Remember him? Donald Trump says he won't commit to backing the Republican nominee should it be someone else. July 31st, 2015, Meet the Press trotted out America's third most dependable both siderist Ron Fournier to explain that while Bernie Sanders is not like Donald Trump, Bernie Sanders is also just like Donald Trump. And at no additional charge to you, the customer, he also explains that Hillary Clinton is sneaky, aloof, and possibly a criminal. Yeah, that was because a good job sides. for him. It, it it never, it never, it literally never stops. There's never a day that goes by. August 7th, 2015, we discussed the first GOP debate and the last episode with Jon Stewart on Comedy Central. Uh, Fox News at this point tried to take down Donald Trump and failed because the GOP base, we noticed, is building up a tremendous resentment against Fox News because, after all, they promised the base that Romney would win. They did. They they lied and said Romney was going to win in a landslide. 
-hmm. They also, you know, were propping up George W. Bush for years and years and years. And Mm -hmm. then uh, the Republican Party had the audacity to suggest that these same people vote for Bush's brother, which uh, they were not interested in being embarrassed anymore. (laughs) No. So they voted (laughs) for Trump. (laughs) August 14th, 2015. Megyn Kelly uh, decides to dredge up the past about Trump's misogyny at the Fox debate. It caused a chain reaction that had Eric Erickson showing off his ass all over Twitter. Trump promised in that debate, Iraq 3, this time we'll blow up the right stuff and take their oil. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the moment, the masks fell away and we could see the Fox News thingy as a negotiation between two mob bosses. Ailes and Trump. August 21st, 2015. Donald Trump proposes building a giant spaceship and firing undocumented immigrants into space. Every other Republican candidate proposes a slightly smaller spaceship. As Trump began taking over the media, our August 28th, 2015 episode was recorded live from breakfast with Trump, egg, sausage, and Trump. Remember that in August of 2015, MSNBC ran empty Trump podiums. Wall to wall. Roger Ailes as Lando Calrissian, <laughs> hat tip commenter, Medicine Man 55. Trump is a Ferengi. Trump, I have altered the deal. Pray I don't alter it any further. Roger Ailes, this deal is getting worse all the time. And you know, we didn't realize, little did we realize, Roger Ailes would be ousted from Fox and die. Mm-hmm. Uh, Trump's supporters are deranged but not stupid. They know they were lied to by Fox. Megyn Mm -hmm. Kelly was the one to walk down to the counting room in her fuck me pumps and tell everyone that for real, Romney lost after two weeks of wall to wall promising Romney would win in a landslide. Mm -hmm. They know that one of the reasons they lost is the Obama coalition. No one will tell them it's also because Republican ideas are terrible. Choosing zombie-eyed Granny Starver as your running mate was also a terrible Mm -hmm. idea. Mm -hmm. Republicans want to win so badly, they'll take endorsements from Stormfront and David Duke in uh, summer of 2015. And now Stormfront and David Duke run the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. Uh, October 16, 2015, Marco Rubio is now the chosen savior of the GOP, which is great. The news everywhere was Trump, 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 Trump. And... At a No Labels conference, Joe Lieberman introduced Donald Trump. I believe it was the Problem Solver Caucus, Mm -hmm. uh, which we learned later uh, you got to be in and got an award for if you gave them a check. I'm sure that check was from one of Donald Trump's charities where he ripped people off. But yeah, Joe Lieberman introduced Donald Trump at a No Labels conference, which was like a perfect encapsulation of everything that needs to end in this country. November 6, 2015, the election's now one year away, the 2016 election. And Mark Halperin gave the groveliest interview to Trump ever. He also told Joe Scarborough that the Hillary email scandal is not a joking matter and is not going away. Hmm. Mm -hmm. On uh, December 18th, 2015, the week of that, our show covered the fact that the shock and horror kept growing. The Washington Post tells us that blocking Donald Trump is, quote, just another example of how how we isolate ourselves online. Uh, There's a Tom Edsel article you can look up from that period called, Can This Really Be Donald Trump's Republican Party? I believe we've answered that question. The answer is yes. Philip Klein of the Washington Examiner said, a Trump win would validate liberals' caricatures of Republicans. Yes, it did. And I had the privilege. (laughs) It it sure as hell did. Golly, all this stuff came true. And I had the privilege of taking the lads, uh, uh, Junior Dude and his friends, to go see Star Wars, which was the highlight for me of that week. Mm Mm-hmm. January 1st, 2016, Pod Save America is still a year away from existing, and we're up to episode 317. Strip (laughs) Flash, you just put that in there. I did. I'm sorry, I did. On February 2nd, 2016, Trump and Sanders became the official Beltway narrative. It's the extremes on both sides, Blue Gal. Extremes on both sides. Mm -hmm. By February 26th of 2016, Trump, Scarborough, and Mika got caught on a hot mic previewing the questions and topics ahead. Yeah, that was pretty bad. Uh, On March 26, 2016, again, the week of, on our show, uh, soon-to-be-disgraced sexual predator Les Moonves announced that Trump is bad for America, but great for CBS. April 22nd, 2016, Joe Scarborough finally admitted there was never a tea party. Yes. Uh, We 
devoted most of our April 29th show of 2016 in a call for kindness and generosity between Democrats now that the primaries were over. Please give people who are having a tantrum a wide berth. Give people who are brokenhearted your support. We liberals are not a serene people, but pushing for justice requires a vigilance of a calm heart. Uh, in a last-ditch effort this week to save the Republican nomination for Ted fucking Cruz, Ted Cruz teamed up with Carly Fiorina, who proceeded to go full Spiro Agnew on the press. May 5th, 2016, Donald Trump won the Republican nomination. Mm -hmm. On May 13th, 2016, we note that good old Chuck Todd was being interviewed on the Keeping It 1600 podcast, which was the precursor podcast to Pod Save America. Yeah, they had Chuck Todd on, huh? They did. Good old Chuck uh, Todd. <laughs> you're not you're not being real gentle here, Drift Glass, with our with our friends over at the pod. I'm just <laughs> I'm just reading history as it happened, Blue Gal. I'm <laughs> I'm I'm not leading one just I'm I'm the Walter Cronkite of podcast gone by. <laughs> May twentieth, twenty sixteen. The Breitbart cult sicked the anti-Semitic dogs on Bill Crystal. Boy, did they. They sure shit did. Uh, mm -hmm. Even the police began to sit up and take notice. It was mm -hmm. something else. Yeah. What, something about a renegade Jew. Yeah, it was, it was they bad. They called him. Yeah. It was and, you know, awful. And they went on to occupy the White House. So there you I go. I did not delete this next one, Drift Glass, because no. it is a landmark in our marriage, I it have is. to say. It is. Uh, the week of June 24th, 2016, we both reached the conclusion that The Lobster, the movie, is just is just bad. It's just so very, very bad. It, it was the worst movie I've ever seen in the theater, ever. Yep. yep. And uh, you and I sort of always recall that as we're going to the movie, and you say, do you want, you want to skip this one and go see The Lobster again? <laughs> <laughs> I always say, no, <laughs> that'll no, be no, thank fine. You. No. July 22nd, 2016, the Republican convention was OMG, two minutes hate that ran for days, uh, lock her up, Melania plagiarism, and there were Russians everywhere. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, it was um, General Flynn leading the lock her up chant. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Hugh Hewitt was blabbing about how he, he, Donald Trump, would make the pivot from plagiarism to perjury, because Hillary Benghazi emails. Mm -hmm. That was the yep. that was the song they were singing, man. Uh, and the week of July 29th, 2016, was the Democratic Convention, which was the mirror opposite of the GOP. Day one was Al Franken and Senator Silverman. Day two, the media cannot believe their own ears at Trump's insulting a gold star family. Yeah, he did that. He really did that. Uh, day three was liberal rope-a-dope, especially uh, regarding uh, gun violence. Uh, Dave Weigel tweets, if Obama lives as long as Jimmy Carter, he'll be giving speeches at the DNC until 2052. From your lips to God's ears there, Weigel. Yep. August 5th, 2016, après le déluge. Some Republicans are positioning themselves to be ready for the post-Trump spoils. Mm -hmm. Trump can't even hire competent liars. He's got Corey Lewandowski and Katrina Pearson. Voting rights are making a comeback in five states. Uh, there was this thing called the USA Freedom Kids. They were terrifying. And they were in red, white, and blue. They were so cute. Yeah. Uh, dancing for Donald Trump. And they were supposed to be paid by him. And, and there was some conflict about that. He stiffed him. Uh, <clears throat> rigged elections is a new thing. Uh, and uh, Michael Steele and Mark Halpern are desperate to give Trump props for correcting one. Count them. One. Of our his big dumb lies. Uh, the week of August nineteenth, two thousand sixteen, was our fifth wedding anniversary, and we podcast anyway. We podcast. We podcasted on our wedding and we podcasted on our wedding day yeah. too. We uh, surgeries out of town, um, drunk off my ass. <laughs> we will podcast. No, no, no you no, you weren't usually drunk off your ass. But We're pretty careful. Certainly, about that. Uh, you know, my mom passing mm -hmm. away and your stepdad passing away mm -hmm. yep uh were part of the process that we went through we were still podcasting yep. during those weeks uh to talk to our people well we thought it was really important we still think it's really important yep, yep. yes we do august 26 2016 two months before the election and meet the press was already cleaning up after the soon-to-be failed republican party with a new special gop meet the press beyond trump yeah it was I read this thing and it was, it's pretty special. We'll put, we'll post the link, but it was, 
you know, if Donald Trump loses, as seems likely, uh, the GOP is go- every faction of the GOP is going to blame every other. But if they win, if Trump wins, if that should happen, some freak show should happen, um, he'll have no support from Congress because congressional leaders uh, just don't, will not support his agenda. And yep. th- then he'll it'll basically be a, a, a stillborn presidency because he'll never get anything done because congressional leaders will oppose him. Oh, my God. You really don't understand the Republican Party at all, do you, Meet the Press? Uh, September 2nd, Meet the Press was among the worst I'd ever seen at the time. I went back to doing Sunday shows a little bit. The media is now clearly complicit in the trumpeting. They're up to their chins in it. Read the next one, too. September 23rd, 2016, we talked a lot about the next great struggle will be to memorialize our times, to remember things, to remember what was happening. Don't let it fade away. Don't let people pretend the past didn't happen or it was shaped differently or somehow um, they never said what they said or did what they did. Hold them accountable for the things that happened. And that's still the great struggle of our time. And that's why we're doing this particular episode. Mm -hmm. September 30th, 2016, we did a show called High Anxiety. Because even after Trump got his ass handed to him in the debate, the Trump shirts were unmoved and undecideds were still pouty that the unicorn party was unavailable and both sides was still the coin of the realm. We were really nervous yeah, we were. about all of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hillary has a base that is much larger than Trump's and has the endorsements of more Republican newspaper editorial boards than ever in history. Why are we so tired? Because we're carrying the weight for both parties. Our party is the only one big enough for every atheist listener to this podcast and Reverend William Barber. Yep. And uh, I told my mom, uh, Mm -hmm. October 21st, 2016, my mom became very ill. I saw her over Halloween and uh, she, all she wanted to know on her deathbed was, is Mrs. Clinton going to win? Mm Mm-hmm. And I told her, yes, she is. Mm -hmm. Uh, That that was that week. Yes, it was. That was a very, very tough week. Um, October 28th, uh, my birthday week, more or less, uh, we started talking about Operation Memory Hole, uh, about how many different ways will there be in the future to pretend that none of this is happening. Uh, This was also the week that respectable Republicans, and this is really important, like Nicole Wallace and Jennifer Rubin suddenly got very upset because they were being treated like the right had always treated us dirty liberals. November 4th, 2016, we predicted if Trump wins, expect the worst of 2000 to 2007 on speed up. Yep. And November 9th, 2019, worst case scenario happened. Uh, We said that we're just going to talk today. Uh, we did. This was the day after the election. Yep. We did a special podcast. We didn't have show notes. We did because there, there was nothing left to say. Really, uh, we mm-hmm. just said we're going to talk. Uh, that Donald Trump won, and will be the next president of the United States. Period. Full stop. Tim Kaine, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton all gave the kind of classy, noble speeches you hope your leaders will give in good times or in bad. Uh, but now we're in bad times. We're in very, very bad times. And however you're feeling today, as long as you're taking care of yourself and maybe helping those around you, that's fine. Democrats got beaten last night because the Republican Party is really excited at the thought of a racist liar in the White House because it will finally wipe that smug look off those goddamn liberals' faces. It'll make the libtards cry, period. That's why they elected him. That's, that's, what, that's why they elected him. Yep. They elected him to own the liberals. Democrats got beat because enough Democrats stayed home to swing the election to Trump. You can cut it up any way you like. But please stay the hell off of Twitter and please don't go looking to pin the tail on anyone just yet. We're fighting against a mob whose core beliefs and opinions can be reprogrammed by Fox News overnight to anything that suits them. If you want to start to think about how to fix this, please start by stop listening to people who pretend they have no idea who these Republican base is and how things got this way and start listening to people who know these fuckers and have been calling them by their true name all along. Two weeks later on November 25th, Junior Dude asked about the Nixon impeachment. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's my son. (laughs) Drift Glass told him that things were different back then. Catching someone doing something horrid on tape actually mattered. And there were creatures called principled Republicans who wept when they heard Nixon on the tape. Yep. 
Um, the week of December 2nd, 2016, it was recorded live next to Mitt Romney's balls, which are currently on display in the gift shop at Trump Tower. Uh, we gave some advice, which was pick your ground and fight for it. And remember that every time you hear a both siders from the media, you are seeing a Trump collab- collaborator. Do not trust them and shut off your TVs when you see one. Right. Mm-hmm. December 9th of 2016, there was a Bible bitch where I read Luke 21. Watch out for the doomsday deceivers. Many leaders are going to show up with forged identities, claiming I'm the one or the end is near. Don't fall for any of that. When you hear of wars and uprisings, keep your head and don't panic. This is routine history and no sign of the end. And that week, the Pope told Donald Trump he was a shit eater who's going to hell. (laughs) (laughs) Which is pretty sweet, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we, we reminded everyone to quit waiting for the liberal media. You have to be the liberal media. And yeah. That's what we're trying to do. Yeah, we are the liberal media. So we're here. Uh, the week of December 16th, 2016, we talked about conservatism as an addiction, as like, like heroin or alcohol. The addict would sooner die than admit to having a problem and always has a million excuses for why nothing is ever their fault. There is one difference, however. Conservative interventions don't work. Deprogramming might work, but until it's become profitable, it will never happen. This is also the week that ta Coates and Charlie Pierce talked about the problem of the too decent president. That Obama was always great talking about who we would like to be, but terrible at facing who we actually are. December 23rd, 2016, we were recording live from Chapter 1 of Donald Trump and the Half-Blind Trust. Uh, Newt Gingrich just proposed making Trump an emperor. Uh, and more real Americans are w- woke up to the fact that they just voted away their health insurance. Uh, the Internet kitties hear that in honor of Kellyanne Conway being named a Trump senior advisor, that in addition to a men's stall and a women's stall, the bathrooms at the White House will now include a Lenny Reeve stall. That still tickles me. <laughs> Sean Spicer, Kellyanne Conway, Corey Lewandowski become part of the national lexicon. December 30th, 2016, seeing the writing on the wall, we signed up our first fake sponsor. This week's episode of The Adventures of the Cornfield Resistance is brought to you by McGuffin's Muffins. McGuffin's Muffins, building strong plot points 12 ways. Uh, This is the week that Sean Hannity declared that because every media outlet in America was secretly in the tank for Hillary, the mainstream press should not be allowed to cover Donald Trump. As Jay Rosen pointed out, a few years ago, that was a bridge too far. Now is a plausibly te- a plausible test of poisoned waters. January 6, 2017, Matthew Dowd stepped on many, many rakes in a very short time. He eventually used both sides to bail himself out and announced he might run for the Senate. Mm-hmm. Along with everyone else, David Gregory launched a podcast. Spoiler, it lasted about nine months. January 13, 2016, Chuck Todd begins polishing the silver for the new regime, You know, the if only Obama had compromised more on Obamacare, we wouldn't be having these problems. Uh, This was the the least explosive news this week was that Bill O'Reilly was a lady molester. Uh, Barack Obama's farewell speech was quite good and beamed in from some alternate reality that was much nicer than ours. We found out this week that the law firm overseeing Trump's compliance with his business is Morgan Lewis, which was named, we're not kidding, Russian Law Firm of the Year in 2016. And finally, proving that nothing but grim death will ever stop Holy Joe Lieberman from surfacing like a floaty turd just long enough to stab his former party in the back, Jeff Sessions, he announced, Joe Lieberman announced, will be a principled, fair, and capable attorney general. And then we hit Trump Inauguration Week. Yeah. Where we reminded everyone to chop wood and carry water because Trump is all they've got. Uh, and we were already starting Affordable Care Act protests. Mm-hmm. Uh, Matthew Dowd uh, actually reached out to Driftglass and asked him to stop writing about him. <laughs> yeah, I declined yes. respectfully. Yeah. The Women's um, March was remarkable. Mm-hmm. The state. This was January 27th show with our 300, no, excuse me, 372nd episode. The State Department's entire senior management team resigned. The doomsday clock was set. Closer to midnight for the first time in years, the USDA was told to shut up. The EPA was told to shut up. 
The national parks got their Twitter account suspended for doing math in public. It was a suspension of visas. We started talking about Trump's folly, the wall. And there were developed that week at least 15 alt-federal agency Twitter accounts. Meanwhile, Sean Spicer tweeted out his password twice in two days. <laughs> the entire State Department senior staff of six resigned. The head of the Border Patrol resigned. Uh, Pod Save America launched. At this point, everything went to warp speed. Greenpeace hung a resist sign above the White House, and it begins. Yes, indeed. The week of February 3rd, 2017, Donald Trump pissed off the Australians. Imagine that, the Australians. Uh, second, we asked, how do you fuck up a prayer breakfast? It's a slam dunk. How do you do it? Third, we note, how do you fuck up relations with Australia? Come on, man. Uh, and President Stupid decided that his pillow talk with Putin did not need to be recorded. February 10th, 2017, we signed up our second fake sponsor, Dukakis Khakis. Michael Dukakis's line of sensible men's pants, Dukakis Khakis, they're not so good for running in. They're sensible pants for senseless times. The GOP party line is that we don't need to investigate anything with Donald Trump. It's all okay now besides who even knows if any laws were broken. Uh-huh. Uh, the week of March 17, 2017, we decided to boil down the news to the six basic stories that we asked our listeners to pay attention to. Number one, the party of Trump is trying like hell to gut health care for the poor, the weak, the infirm, the elderly, and the middle class in order to deliver hundreds of billions of dollars in tax cuts to their paymasters. Number two, Vladimir Putin massively interfered with the, with the American presidential election on behalf of Donald Trump and his cronies. Number three, Trump and his cronies are wholly owned stooges of Vladimir Putin. Number four, Trump and his cronies cannot stop lying about everything all the time. Number five, the party of Trump is so desperate to gut health care and cut billions in taxes, they're willing to look the other way as Vladimir Putin's stooges in the White House wreck the government and lie incessantly about everything. And number six, the base of the party, the party of Trump, is either too fucked in the head stupid or too in love with the idea of being a foot soldier in the American fascist party to care about the first five stories. Mexico ain't got to build a damn thing, but Meals on Wheels is on the block. Fuel assistance, basically anything that helps the poor or the working class. In April, Steve Mnuchin, you know, financial genius Steve Mnuchin, said he can't guarantee that the middle class won't pay more under the giant plutocrat tax cut. By the way, your 401k is toast. The government was open for one more week, so visit your nearest national park now. That was in April of 2017. In May of 2017, we wanted to be very clear that you want to show what happened with James Comey. He thought Hillary would win and the GOP would keep the House, which meant his funders would be running witch hunts forever and would be dragging him through the mud unless he covered his ass. So what did he do? He covered his ass and wrecked the election. Roger Ailes died 20 years too late. Net neutrality took a huge blow. Jason Chaffetz retired from the House and spun through the revolving doors to become a Fox News host. Ben Carson called poverty a state of mind. Then he just floated away on a bed of grifted money from the totally not racist conservative party. And of course, this was the week of tiki torch-wielding fascists marching in Charlottesville that killed a woman. June 2017. Oh, and, and there were good people on both sides, Driftglass. Yes, let's not forget good people on both sides. Yeah. Yes. June 2017, while you were busy, House Republicans voted to gut Dodd-Frank. While you were busy, President Stupid dropped lie heap completely from the budget. This will affect 6.7 million Americans. In Illinois, over 330,000 people will be left out in the cold next winter. The least offensive thing President Stupid has done was shift money from Eric Trump's kids' cancer charity into his business. Scott Pruitt lied about almost 50,000 jobs have been added in coal. He was off by 49,000 jobs. Trump took credit for the $110 billion arms deal to Saudi Arabia that began in the Obama administration. Also, there is no deal, just letters of interest. Also, the Saudis haven't even paid off the last arms deal. Jeff Sessions lied to Congress again. Also, he discovered a new imaginary I don't want to testify privilege. Uh, it nearly exceeded the Gonzalez threshold. 
And uh, thank you to the ACLU for all of their work. The travel ban failed again. In 2017 July, the Cornfield Resistance could rightfully brag that our chief ethics officer never quits in disgust. 44 states and Washington, D.C. have told Tr voter Trump suppression commission to go pound sand. 18 states and counting are suing Betsy DeVos. Local Trumpkins are sick of all the Trump bashing. And they're willing to debate stuff as long as you never bring up anything that happened in the past. All of their Obama-era behavior is now off limits. They're not talking about any of that. That's not fair. NPR tweeted the Declaration of Independence, and the Trump supporters went ballistic and called it propaganda. Uh, Iowa Congressman Steve, calves the size of cantaloupe's king, wants to use funding from food stamps and Planned Parenthood to pay for President Stupid's border wall. 58% of Republicans and Republican-leading independents thinks college hurts the country. Now that repeal and slow death has died, the GOP is back to repeal and fuck you. The CBO says this bill would leave 32 million more uninsured and double premiums over the, the next decade. Uh, this is when Trump threatened to hold health care for tens of millions of American poor and working class hostage to force Democrats to capitulate. Tom Pride and HHS are using ACA funds to undermine ACA. As predicted, Mitch McConnell, Donald Trump, and Sarah Huckabee Sanders have begun lowering the blame the Democrats lifeboats into the water. And the mooch turned out to be one sweary little goon. That one is, uh, that was uh, Scaramucci, and he's still around. The Boy Scouts earned their deranged bigot badge at their jamboree, and we are out of time. Yeah, he lasted one Scaramucci, which yeah, became one whole a thing. Yeah. yeah, and he swore a lot. It, it's weird that we don't remember uh, that he swore a whole lot more than any, let's say, Muslim Democratic Congress people did. He did. He mm -hmm. did. And and more more virulently, and, and uh, yeah, he was colorful. But this is the point at which um, time started to loop back on itself. And uh, events just started sort of repeating themselves over and over faster and faster. The resistance was huge. The midterms were huge. But the song remained the same. Republican ideas are terrible. And don't you dare call it Trumpism. And both sides don't. Yep. And we are out of time, too. But we got through 2017. Uh, and uh, Which is more than I can say for Roger Ailes. Right. Oh, jeez. That was in poor taste. <laughs> we, we appreciate you guys and your support of our podcast work so much. Thank you for hanging in there with us for nine years. Some of you have been with us for nine years. Those of you that have been with us for a shorter time, uh, it's not too late to start supporting the show. And uh, we want you to know that uh, we love you. We're glad you listen. Each week we post to our Facebook page and website an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week there are two Internet Kitties. Aranita and Richard Parker. They are former uh, feral cats. Uh, they have a great way of avoiding Trump coverage. They sit behind the television set where it's nice and warm. What a great idea. And then you yeah. can push the television set over. That's a great idea. <laughs> no, but then it's not warm anymore. <laughs> oh, that's true. Good point. Well, then the fire starts and it gets real warm, but uh, still. They seem to be very happy back there. And mm -hmm. uh, there, it, after much turf war, apparently there was a long-running turf war over that, and now they've learned to share. So that's nice. You can send in your internet kitty to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, where you can also write to both of us and let us know the important news story that we left out of our nine years in review. It's probably in the 54-page version <laughs> the long it's, version of drift this. Class is going to publish <laughs> his blog we have just i am so i am go and look at drift just google drift glass you'll find it and uh it's 54 pages and you'll enjoy just the just the jennifer rubin stuff was hilarious oh yeah yeah no you'll yeah. you'll enjoy the whole thing uh so do feel free to write us we do love hearing from you be aware if you write us at any of our addresses we reserve the right to read your email or u.s postal service Go Postal Unions, letter on the air, unless you say otherwise. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job. Approximately one half of 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. Our PayPal postal address information swag you can buy a both sides don't bumper sticker or t-shirt all that information is there at proleftpod.com 
Please share our show on social media, and thank you so much for doing that. Hey, Drift Glass, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Oh, Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties look forward to another nine years, and thank you all for everything. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, dubbing. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2018, DGBG Productions Incorporated.